Hello, I'm Stan Atkinson in San Francisco. And I'm Margaret Pelley in Sacramento. Just one week ago, we, you, the city, and all the communities around it were shaken by a truly powerful force. And the shaking goes on. Just tonight, before 6.30, there was another aftershock, 4.5 on the Richter scale. There are no reports of any damage or any injuries. Tonight, we're going to look back at the effects of that powerful force. But most of all tonight, we're going to look ahead. And that's why we have chosen to be here, rather than in front of a pile of rubble or a broken free freeway, to be here in front of this, something that truly epitomizes not just what this area is about, but in fact, all of California symbolizes its strength, its character, and as history has shown us time and time again, its resilience always in the face of adversity. We're going to look at what the future is for the people of the Bay Area and for all of those in Northern California who suddenly became victims on Tuesday of a powerful earthquake. We're also going to focus in on the challenges ahead and we're going to see how some of those challenges already have been met. And finally, we're going to find out what needs to be done and how we can help. But to understand what lies ahead, it's important to appreciate what has gone before. So tonight we begin at the beginning, here in this studio, with the way Stan and I reported those first frightening moments, 5.04 p.m. Tuesday, October 17th, when the earth began to shake. As you can see by what's happening to the uh, blinds in back of us, we're having an earthquake in Northern California, somewhere around the Sacramento region. Um, we. Uh, We'll still continue to bring the news to you, of course. Hopefully, there will be no bad news to tell. As a matter of fact, it's been a long time in coming. I don't like earthquakes. <laughs> in San Francisco, the World Series pregame show was on the air. Take, 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 take. And suddenly, it was off the air. At an electronic store in San Mateo, a security camera recorded the quake as it happened. A Sacramento office building swayed as workers took cover. Uh, we were up on 16 and um, the floor started to shake. And so we all just got underneath doorways and pretty much that's what everybody in, on our whole floor did. Jack Bassett grabbed his home video camera as water sloshed out of his backyard swimming pool. In Los Angeles, seismographs were recording the first shock waves, and a local newscaster was caught in mid-sentence. Okay, All right. we have just received word of a major earthquake. We hope for good California. news. We're still not entirely sure of the extent of this. We but the news only got worse. 911 emergency. Oh my God, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. The upper deck of the Bay Bridge has collapsed on Oakland side. The upper deck of the Bay Bridge has collapsed. 911 emergency. Uh, this is Roy Stearns and Live Copter 3 over uh, San Francisco. What you're looking at is a picture we shot just a few minutes ago of the Oakland Bay Bridge. This is the portion that collapsed. It is about one 50-foot section portion of the bridge right over the stand that goes down into the water. This is right at the cantilever section, and this is the only part of the bridge that we saw collapsed. It is now 5.15, Tuesday, 17th of October, 1989. Helicopters are in the area. The bridge has collapsed. Two cars. No one is injured at this time. First to be on the scene. Then, word of an even greater catastrophe. Oxygen! Oxygen! The Nimitz Freeway had collapsed. Yeah, so there's a lot of people, and there's a woman in there right now. She's trapped in there. We need a hydraulic jack to get her out of there. All right, here we go. That one. That one. Give me that one. people under this pit. Uh, most of them, we got most of them out, but there's quite a few that's it's just, just no help. 
Back across the bay, buildings in San Francisco's Marina District had crumbled. Ordinary people joined with police in searching for the victims. Did you actually hear anybody? Kind of or did you just hear something? Does anybody have any flashlights in their house? They might start. Does anybody have a flashlight? A flashlight! We were standing over here. It lasted for about eight seconds. And about four seconds into it, we turned around because we were going to run for the playground. And we saw this go. And it just quietly collapsed. It was so bizarre. It was just like a quiet crunch. It just crunched down. All, all of this damage that's happened, it just went, it just quietly crunched, like so eerie. It was so eerie. Then a new fear, gas leaks. Police wanted everybody out. Back at Candlestick Park, confusion and uncertainty. Creighton Sanders is at Candlestick. Creighton, it looks like it has been a scene of panic. What's going on there? Panic is the right word. It was the most terrifying moment any of us have ever spent in our lives. It only lasted but a few moments. There wasn't going to be any baseball that night. I've lived here all my life, and it never scared me in an earthquake. That was the first one that scared me. As fans headed home, the full extent of the disaster was now becoming apparent. For some, it was all too much to take. 911 emergency. Oh, boy, I don't seem like I can take much more. Ma'am, I, I know. Just hang in there. And then a new threat, fire. A building in rubble in the marina district had begun to burn. As night wore on, there were new reports of damage. And to the south of San Francisco, reports of bridges down, homes and businesses destroyed. Landslides had blocked major highways and huge cracks had opened up in the earth. San Francisco airport was closed. The computers were knocked out. The car rental agencies were jammed. Planes were diverted to Sacramento. In the hours that followed, we saw the destructive force of nature at its worst. But we witnessed human bravery. One Jefferson Street. Two, three, zero, zero, Francisco Street. These are homes that will be demolished. This is the red list. Concern and compassion at its best. You might feel a little cool. No, you're in your truck. You heard me in the front side. Your truck is upside down. They are the images of disaster, the images of courage, the images of hope we will never forget. Now comes the job of rebuilding, the job of putting homes and businesses and bridges and freeways all back in place, the job of putting lives back together again. Tonight, we're gonna to look at how all of that is going. We sent three of our reporters to three of the area's hardest hit, not so much to chronicle the destruction but to record the recovery. Alicia Malaby reports tonight from the Nimitz Freeway, the scene of the I-880 collapse. Rich Ibera went south of the Bay Area to an area severely hit, closest to the areas to the quake's epicenter. And Chuck Coppola went to San Francisco's Marina District, that picture postcard part of this city that suffered so much destruction. Here is what each of them learned about the damage and about what's being done to recover. I can't believe this. I can't believe this has happened. <laughs> this is all like a dream. That this, this isn't, this isn't the building. This isn't the building that I lived for 11 years. <laughs> the earthquake that hit a week ago has now hit Mary Ellen Sexer. I lived, <laughs> I lived right here, but it's on the third story. You think I'd see some, some of my clothes or something, or my Ted's birdcage or something. Ted, Ted, where are you? A gas line that broke fueled the fire. It burned all night. Fire crews had to pump water from the bay because water lines in the marina also broke, then ran dry. Now, one week after the earthquake, Mary Ellen Sexer and thousands of others whose homes either burned down, fell down, or are now too damaged to live in, 
find themselves mired in paperwork. Okay, how long is that going to take? I have no idea, but it should be as soon as we can get it back to work. Okay, the address I have here is the address that burned down. Monday, Mary Ellen Sexer spent two hours standing in long lines for food stamps. I would never think I'd go, I'd go in a place like that. I really feel lost. I, I really feel I am lost. I... But because just before the earthquake, she got paid from the department store where she works, she was not eligible for any food stamps. I was very angry. I, I said, I lost everything. How could I, you know, where am I going to get food? Where am I going to eat? And he said, well, I'm not a social worker. I don't know. Next, Marina Middle School, the evacuation center that's become a clearinghouse for practically everything else. The phone company, the gas company. I went over there, and they, over at pj and &E, they couldn't help me because the main office does not know that my building burned down, and they'll keep on sending me the bills. The housing authority, uh, yeah. Most of the people that, that are coming in are still in shock, and they're kind of wandering in, and they you just kind of find out what their needs are and see if we can't get them filled. So we're we're kind of a 180-pound rabbit's foot right now, trying to help help them out. Um, this is in San Mateo. One bedroom we'll pick up. Um, housing available in Pacifica. Small space. Please call Kate. My problem is I want in San Francisco. I want to be at least be close to work. More than 800 people have offered apartments to rent, some at reduced rates for those made homeless by the earthquake. It is hardest of all for the elderly. For them particularly, they, a lot of them have lived 35, 45 years in the same apartment, and now they're somewhere else, and everything familiar is gone, and so if they can get in and get 15 minutes worth of stuff out that they can touch and be with, at least as a part of their life, that uh, makes some sense to them. This is the important thing. Her brother just passed away about a month ago, and she went to South America. She got there, and he was dead already, just to see him. And before she got there, he died of a stroke. So this is wonderful. In this neighborhood, more than 40 buildings were either destroyed or will have to be demolished. The gas company says there are so many leaks all natural gas lines here must be replaced. That will take at least four and a half months. Mary Ellen, one of thousands here, instantly homeless, will stay in a downtown hotel that has donated rooms through the end of the month. She has also applied for federal and state grants. The first state assistance check was handed out today. Federal checks may take another week. Moving slowly, but at least I'm making a little progress. Do you feel better? A little bit. A little bit. I don't feel as, as, um, I still feel confused, and, uh, but I do feel I'm making progress. I just gave to United Way, and I donated, I, you know, money, and I never thought I would be here. In San Francisco, Chuck Coppola, Channel 3 reports. She's just in my arms, beating and banging, and nothing fell, and everything flew. Santa Cruz County mourned the loss of six lives, four of them with the collapse of the Pacific Garden Mall in Santa Cruz. Those who survived the quake count themselves as the lucky ones, even some who lost their homes. Things were falling all over, and it's ama amazing. That little four-month baby girl was right there, just, just trembling, and not a thing dropping on her, and everything, all of the small stuff came down all over, and that little baby was not touched at all. Your belongings are safe. Now, it by no means means that they're going to get out the wrecking ball and knock the building down. Some people had only the clothes on their back to show for years of saving and work to own a home. The future will be years of owing to pay off what they had. A mortgage to the hilt. Um, we have everything that we own in this house, and... You know, we've just got to try and rebuild, or we have nothing. We put a lot of money down. Insurance. Of course not. <laughs> Hardly anybody has earthquake insurance. Okay. I have a Take it out. Your eyes. We're going. We're out of here. Bricks tumbled from a bakery in Watsonville to take one life. Old Victorians cracked and crumbled, and are charming no more. Tents have become home to thousands, some because they can't go in their houses, and some because they're just afraid. We miss our home, yeah. But are you scared to go back inside? Oh, yeah, because uh, this, this morning was another earthquake, and we ran outside again.
The aftershocks make salvaging belongings risky, but it's hard to say goodbye to everything you've owned without at least trying. Inspector said, uh, uh, I said, you got about 20 minutes. You've got 20 minutes to get out of here today. I've lived here 30 years. How do you expect me to get out of here in 20 minutes? Yet Joe and his family do what they can, packing away in boxes 30 years of furniture, clothes, and memories, saving what they treasure most. Mira, mijo, you put him in a real safe place, yeah. okay, in a seat, we'll, maybe. We'll, huh? yeah, we'll take that yeah. front with us. Okay. To survive, the family must split up to live with different relatives. And the outlook isn't good to bring everyone back together under one roof. Funny, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck because I was, uh, I, I've, got, uh, I, I've got a budget that I was on and it's just from, from, uh, from payday to payday, uh, uh, small savings, and, and uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in pretty bad shape. school gym serves as church this Sunday. The congregation has survived, but not so St. Patrick's Catholic Church. This church is more than a place where our Catholics meet on Sunday. The tall steeple of St. Patrick's Church has stood guard over Watsonville since before the great quake of 1906. Now it may be torn down, it's not certain yet. But if it is, this city will lose more than a church. It will lose a landmark. Don't lose heart, because Watsonville it's going to need people of heart to make it through all this. People aren't giving up, but rebuilding takes courage, and not just lumber, a hammer, and saw. It's just, uh, you know, one of those things. I mean, you, what are you going to do? In Santa Cruz County, Rich Ibera, Channel 3 reports. I still have moments of absolute disbelief, of moments of thinking she's going to come through the door and, and um, say something to me. This East Bay home bears scars from the earthquake in more ways than one. Cracked walls and a shattered life. 36-year-old Donna Marsden worked at a nearby university. Her van pool came home every day on time, except last Tuesday. I found out pretty much where the van was and maybe 15 seconds later or 30 seconds sooner. They, they would have been past the, the structure. Bruce Marsden is coping with the unthinkable. His wife was killed in the collapse of Interstate 880. The couple would have celebrated their fourth wedding anniversary Thursday. Marsden describes his wife as a champion of lost causes, who loved pets, plants, and especially children. It's, uh, it's a healing process, and it started. And uh, I start thinking about you know, at least I was lucky to find her so soon because there's still people who don't know. You know, it's, it's going on. It's going on for me. And I'm grateful for that. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm rejoicing and, and you know, dying my head with her. Trucks working on the collapsed Cypress Freeway break the calm that settled in this West Oakland neighborhood. After a week of tourists and gawkers passing through, residents are putting the earthquake behind them. It might change a lot of people. I hope it do. I hope it all bring us all together instead of apart. Look at here, see? Can you see over here? Here's your foundation over there. And it moved all the way across. That's four feet. The earthquake has sent John Anderson searching for a new home. Forty years of memories crashed into rubble. Material things you can replace, but you can't replace a life, so nobody, nobody died or anything. The Anderson home could collapse at any time. It's so dangerous they can only salvage a few personal belongings and some furniture. But their entire family, including 14-year-old George, escaped unharmed. I feel better now, but it's still fighting and we still get nightmares. We can't, you know, it's hard to sleep. I never wanted to leave. I mean, it's, it's just that much. I've been here so long, it's hard to pull up roots and leave. And this is the only thing that makes me pull up and go. A lot of things we, we uh, uh, would like to keep, just, you know, things we've had a long time. There's no way. So we just have to take our losses and try to move on. <laughs>
In downtown Oakland, there are other signs of healing. A city that suffered $1.5 billion in damage is rebuilding. Some repairs, though, will take longer than others. City Hall has been closed indefinitely. That means Steve Fort, a blind vendor, will lose his snack bar business. I really don't know where I'm going to go or what I'm going to do next as far as being able to pay the rent and other expenses. Steve is one of many Oakland residents the earthquake has left with an uncertain future. But each tries to find comfort in their own way. For Bruce Marsden, now a young widower, it's sharing some homemade cards he found in his wife's closet. This one's very special. It's like a resolution about herself or a thought that she had. It said, I now dissolve the false belief that life is about suffering. I am rich and free and happy in the many miracles that my lady has given me. I release and forgive everyone and everything for whatever has happened. We are all joyously free now. I believe in miracles. It's God's will. In Oakland, Alicia Malaby, Channel 3 reports. There are some encouraging stories to tell. There is the story of Buck Helm, a 57-year-old man pulled from the rubble of the Nemitz Freeway four days after the quake hit. We couldn't let this program pass without mentioning him. If any one individual symbolizes the determination to survive this disaster, Buck Helm is him. Since his rescue last Saturday, he has made some important progress toward recovery, and all of us are very encouraged. He still has a lot of recovering to do. He has, though, as we said, been a very important symbol, and he is getting better. Doctors say his kidneys are now functioning normally, and he has been taken off dialysis. The prognosis tonight continues to be very encouraging. Now, what about those who escaped the full fury of the quake, those who live and work outside the areas we focused on? Well, life is still anything but normal for them, especially when it comes to getting around. When we come back tonight, transportation... It's been a week now since the big quake and slowly life in some ways in this great city and communities all around is getting back to normal, slowly. Just started raining about five minutes ago. For this time of year, that's normal. The timing is unfortunate though for the victims and the relief workers in the quake. Driving around this Bay Area is anything but normal though. The Bay Bridge is closed. Interstate 880 suffered a total collapse in a mile and a half stretch. A new ferry service is operating across the bay, but is that enough? How are people around here getting around? Mike Boyd has some answers for us. Whether by car, rail, or boat, there are new rules in this world of getting to and from work in the San Francisco Bay Area. First, to succeed, commuters must drastically shift to mass transit, and the numbers show they're doing that. On Monday, the first full day of back to work, 90,000 people used BART during the morning commute hours. Normally, 52,000 do so. That's a 65% increase. Today, 98,000 used the morning commute, an all-time record. Second to succeed, commuters must start earlier, and they've been doing that. Traffic on all bay bridges, for example, is way up during the very early morning hours. Example. The Golden Gate at the 6 to 7 a.m. time frame normally carries 1,500 vehicles. Currently, 4,000 are crossing during that hour. This commuter and this one are out of sync. It's no longer socially acceptable to drive the commute alone. Getting there, will it take longer? That's the only way you can get over to the bridge without driving over the bridge. It might take you hours now to get over the San Mateo Bridge. The captain of this ferry boat is right to a point. It takes longer than usual to drive the bridges still in service, but commuting by ferry is time consuming. The normal 30 minute car trip, San Francisco to Oakland, is more like an hour by sea. We timed the ride from San Francisco's ferry building to Jack London Square, including boarding time, the ride, offloading to a free bus commute to the next destination. Ferry boat ridership is up in the Bay Area. Normally commercial and state boats carry 2,500 commuters per day during the morning rush. 6,000 are now traveling by boat. This is the only way to go over. 
How do you like it? It's not bad. And some commuters will stick it out until they can make other arrangements. I'm leaving the city, yeah. It's too scary. The earthquake really scared me. Ferry boat cost? Comparable to a car, a round trip across the bay at a special commuter rate is $5. It's 7.20 a.m. We're taking BART from Berkeley to San Francisco to measure convenience, time, and cost of the commute, rail versus the automobile. Even though BART has provided extra parking, most lots are full. Parking takes 10 minutes. A round-trip ticket to San Francisco costs $3.70. 7.35. We're on the ramp waiting for the next train to take us under the bay to the Embarcadero. We're going into the Transbay 2. Ride time to San Francisco, 25 minutes. As you can see, standing room only. BART is comfortable and reasonably quiet. Well, it's a little bit slower, uh, but yeah, it, so far it's not too bad. Steve Liebman, like many on this train, normally commutes by car for the immediate future. BART is the alternative. So you had to bite the bullet? Yes. <laughs> it's the only way I can get to work. Oh, I have to do it every day. I have to. I might just spend the night in the city with some friends of mine. Some way to get around. Some way, because this is going to be a drag. 8.15 a.m., we arrive at the Embarcadero station. Less than five minutes later, we're at street level. Commute time, approximately one hour. There are some pleasant transportation surprises to the so-called crisis. Vehicles are moving at a fairly good pace at rush hour. Part of that because Caltrans and the Golden Gate Bridge Authority have lifted all tolls during rush hours. That could change, but not until the Bay Bridge is back in service. And East Bay residents are not rushing into San Francisco by way of the more southerly San Mateo Bridge. Overall, the commute into and out of San Francisco is working, with some inconvenience, but working without the Bay Bridge. From San Francisco, Mike Boyd. Channel 3 reports. And that brings us that brings us now to the question of the hour on the minds of every single Bay Area commuter. How long is this disruption of their commute going to continue? Well, as Roy Stearns reports, the temporary fixes are going to take a few months. The permanent repairs are years off, and the cost of all of it will be staggering. Caltrans began the $10 million job of tearing down the I-880 Cypress Freeway. A week ago today, one mile of it became a massive tomb of twisted steel and concrete for the 63 people confirmed dead so far, just one surviving. This elevated freeway was on the Caltrans list of thousands of bridges to retrofit to today's earthquake standards. The first part of that work had been done. The next phase for total retrofit was still being researched. But even so, Caltrans says the collapse here was a surprise, not caused by faulty construction and not caused, as a Caltrans geologist is quoted as saying, by the soils underneath. He said there's, a, and he mentioned the technical term, but it's a very hard strat of compact sand down there. So he said soil liquefaction is not a problem in that area. And I believe the, uh, governor's investigating team will show that the construction details and the construction standards are not an issue here they were they were built according to the specifications and the code at that time but we are on record that we did not think this kind of a structure would collapse but it did and so while they demolish it caltrans says they have taken pictures and videotape of nearly every square foot of it to continue their investigation as to why it collapsed in the meantime, the goal is to get traffic moving again here through this same freeway corridor with a temporary freeway. Hopefully we'll have that uh, freeway demolished in something on the order of four weeks. We have begun the uh, engineering studies to uh, provide some kind of an interim facility for the uh, uh, traffic. I don't know any more than that. Uh, we do have to do some work to see what can be put in there. So it will take until December to tear this down. Caltrans says it will take until spring, March, or April to build the interim freeway and two years more to rebuild a permanent new freeway here. As for the Embarcadero Freeway and others damaged in the San Francisco area, Caltrans says none of those need to be torn down and all can be shored up with a temporary fix also by spring. 
And that brings us to this scene, two engineers standing on the edge of the collapsed portion of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. The bay, more than 100 feet below them, workers in safety nets beginning the job of fixing the bottom lanes of the bridge. The top lanes were removed by a crane Sunday. However, bridge engineers now say that section is not repairable, but they do say traffic will be back on this bridge in weeks. They're working 24 hours a day out there on all of this work, and they will continue to do that. And we're saying up to four weeks. You know, I made some estimates last week and proved to be way off. So right now, look, it's up to four. If everything works out, it could be less, but it's up to four weeks at this point. It could be earlier. Could be. Is that to restore traffic from both directions? Yes. That's the total permanent fix. Caltrans estimates that it will take anywhere from $500 million to a billion dollars to now fix what fell down. All the state's highways, bridges, and viaducts. And after that, they must still go ahead with phase three of their bridge retrofit program to bring all of those structures to today's earthquake standards. They would like now to accelerate that program during this window of opportunity. But doing that, they say, now depends on how long before this quake fades as a public and political priority. In Sacramento, Roy Stearns, Channel 3 reports. San Francisco's former mayor, Diane Feinstein, doesn't necessarily agree with what the Caltrans engineers are saying, specifically when it comes to the matter of the Embarcadero Freeway, that uh, short haul of elevated roadway around San Francisco's waterfront. And she thinks that elected officials in other cities ought to be paying more attention to the matters of earthquake preparedness, like she did during her tenure as mayor. And things that she did apparently did pay off in terms of safety last week during the quake. Here's John Gibson with Diane Feinstein and what she's recommending and what she's saying after the quake. State of California engineers have decided the Embarcadero Freeway in San Francisco can be patched up and put back into use by commuters. The mayor who prepared San Francisco for last Tuesday's earthquake disagrees. Diane Feinstein, former mayor, current candidate for governor, says, knock it down before it kills someone. But I'm of the opinion that that freeway ought to come down. I believe it ought to come down today. I do not believe that there is evidence that two-tiered freeway structures are the way to go in California. Diane Feinstein held that opinion before Interstate 880 came crashing down, killing dozens of commuters. As she watched San Francisco suffer the earthquake she spent a decade preparing for, she became even more resolute that the role of elected officials is simple. Costly preparations must be made. I think the important thing is that in the pressure of budget considerations, it is always very hard to see the imminency of earthquake proofing. And this quake should bring home to everybody in public life all over the good old U.S. of A. how important it is and that you can't say no to it. It was during Dianne Feinstein's 10 years as mayor that San Francisco's notoriously precarious financial district was almost entirely rebuilt. While they were at it, they decided they better rebuild it right. And the proof that it was rebuilt right came Tuesday when the quake hit, when the financial district did not fall down. Feinstein was criticized for allowing rampant high-rise growth in the financial district. But it was this building spree that allowed earthquake-resistant structures to be built, replacing older earthquake hazards. It was also Diane Feinstein who spent $30 million on Candlestick Park, some of that going for needed earthquake proofing. Primarily, work was done to make certain the canopy did not fall into the seats. And all of Candlestick Park held. And I was, when I thought of it, after he said, I was so proud because there could have been massive loss of life in Candlestick Park. And the fact that you had 60,000 people in that park and um, those overhangs and that baffle stood I think was testament to the fact that the right decision was made and that that overall remodeling package and was a good one. In the hard-hit marina district, devastated residents were willing to blame anyone, including Feinstein, for the apparent lack of preparation for a big quake. 
Water mains went, and buildings folded up like tents. But it was Feinstein's decision to keep the fireboat Phoenix when it would have been easy to drop it from the city budget. And the fireboat pumped the water that saved the marina as a whole. One of the enduring mysteries of this earthquake is going to be why Chinatown is still standing. Diane Feinstein worried for 10 years about the number two combination plate of seven points on the Richter scale and hundreds of unreinforced brick buildings in Chinatown and the Tenderloin. The fact that immediate collapse did not occur this time seems to indicate nothing more than collapse is more likely next time. And Feinstein believes government must invent programs to help private owners reinforce dangerous structures. And the experts say this wasn't the big one. A big one is expected within the next 20 years. Um, the 19 06 earthquake was at least, at least 30 times stronger than this one. I mean, I've got to wonder, you know, would what we have done have been enough had it been a 1906 earthquake of 8.2 instead of 6.9. As prepared as San Francisco was for this quake, it's clear to the former mayor that major cities and the state as a whole needs nothing more than more preparation. In San Francisco, John Gibson, Channel 3 reports. Despite all of San Francisco's preparations, there's still a lot of damage to repair. As Roy Stearns pointed out, that's going to cost a lot of money, billions of dollars. To come up with some of that money, Governor Duke Majin said he intends to call the legislature back to Sacramento for a special session. But political reporter Steve Swatt says the actual agenda hasn't been worked out yet. Steve joins us tonight live from the state capitol. And Steve, what seems to be the hang-up? Well, the main reason is that state government still does not have an accurate fix on how much relief will be necessary. Presumably, that determination will be made by early next week. For the second time in two years, a severe earthquake is forcing a vacationing legislature back to Sacramento for a special session. The Whittier Tembler was much smaller than last week's Bay Quake. Seven deaths, 200 injuries, $350 million in total property damage. But with uncharacteristic dispatch, legislators enacted seven laws that distributed nearly $100 million to quake victims and gave the governor authority to spend the emergency reserve account. Because of the magnitude of the Bay Area earthquake and the enormous job of repairing not only homes and businesses, but the crumbling transportation structure as well, Governor Duke Majin and some legislators were quick to suggest that some form of temporary tax increase might be necessary to pay the bills. But now they seem to be taking a more cautious approach, even as damage estimates continue to rise. Responding to the question of whether or not a tax increase is needed at this time is, in fact, premature, logically, practically, and otherwise. One reason is that there's no accurate damage assessment yet, and it's not known how much Washington will help. The $2.8 billion relief package approved by the House today could change. In addition, California could write checks from its billion-dollar reserve account. And Channel 3 has learned that billions in another pool of money waiting to be invested could be loaned to the state for short-term relief. Right now there's um, about $18 billion in that pool. Two to $3 billion of that could be made available in the form of loans on a short-term basis to meet some immediate needs, but that would have to be paid back by June 30th of next year. If necessary, one levy that could be raised temporarily is the state sales tax. A half-cent increase would generate $120 million a month. And twice before, after severe flooding in Northern California during the winters of 1964 and 68, the gasoline tax was raised temporarily by a penny a gallon. The extra money rebuilt the roads. But nowadays, just spending extra tax money is complicated. A 10-year-old government spending limit allows appropriations in the event of an emergency, but future spending would have to be reduced accordingly. If political leaders do in fact agree to some sort of temporary tax increase, rest assured they will try to find a way around that spending limit. Margaret? Well, Steve, so far California hasn't received everything it's asked for from Congress, has it? Uh, that is correct. As a matter of fact, the California delegation asked for $1 billion more in that relief package and failed miserably, and perhaps that is one reason why local officials here in Sacramento are so reluctant now to talk about a tax increase because if California signals its intention to raise billions of dollars, perhaps Washington will come up with less.
Thank you, Steve. While our elected officials scramble to try to offer assistance, perhaps nothing is more valuable than the advice from people who have suffered from similar tragedies. When we come back tonight, the victims of Hurricane Hugo tell the victims of California what to expect. Earthquakes, of course, are nothing new to California. San Francisco suffered through and survived the most famous of them, the big one, in 1906. In the 1930s, Southern California was shaken by a powerful tremor centered in Long Beach. And in the 50s, a major quake and a strong aftershock shook Kern County in southern San Joaquin Valley. More recently, there was the 1971 quake near Silmar, north of Los Angeles. It destroyed a hospital, sent a freeway overpass crashing down, and caused widespread damage elsewhere. And then, of course, there was Whittier, the quake also near Los Angeles, two years ago this month. We point all this out not to frighten you, but to remind you that we Californians live on some shaky ground. It comes with the territory, and we should always be prepared. Part of being prepared, of course, is knowing what to expect before, during, and after the time that disaster strikes. So we thought it would be interesting and helpful to find out how some victims of another recent disaster are doing, the victims of Hurricane Hugo. Tonight, here's Miles Saunders in Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina, one of the most impressive small cities on the eastern seaboard. Like San Francisco, its pride is in many of its older buildings in elegant residential districts. And like a number of other cities in Northern California this week, it's cleaning up from a disaster. In the months since Hurricane Hugo unleashed its fury on the Carolina coast, Charleston has been trying to get life back to normal. The turning point seems to have come about a week ago. Tourists are coming back to the streets. But there is still a long way to go for the citizens of Charleston, particularly emotionally. Still, they're willing to offer help. Mayor Joseph Riley. The trauma of a disaster like this is potentially extraordinary and if a community gets down and then you can you can get onto the slippery slope that pulls you farther down so we have worked very hard to to encourage our citizens to to be optimistic and to be hopeful and to help each other and that is and that has succeeded we think the water came up through the floor um, filled up this room and then just knocked out the wall but for those who lost their homes or possessions, the recovery has been hard enough. I don't think this neighborhood will ever be the same. No house will be built and look like it did. Mary Rivers and her husband Tommy live on Sullivan's Island, east of Charleston. They plan to rebuild. We talked about coping. I kind of thought it would be down for a while and then coasting up. And it, ha it hasn't really been that way. It's been real up and down. I, I needed to just do things, get organized and and take care of items and then you'd hit a slump and stay there and then you'd come back up and i didn't expect the up and down to last a month and of course it's only been a month it may last a lot longer but i certainly didn't expect the emotions i didn't expect to drive up here and and just fill with tears every time i'd look around a month later and it still happens i learned that self-reliant isn't the way to go that, that when you try to be um so self-sufficient and do everything yourself it doesn't work that that friends offer help and you learn to say yes the generosity and the love and the help and the food and the money and people that we received from all over the country not only helped us recover but lifted our spirits the the human spirit and its capacity to help and to give to each other has touched us more than anyone will ever imagine so uh, the second we realized the disaster that was befalling California was the second we committed to help. The nature of the two disasters is obviously quite different. The end result for those who lost everything they had is not, either here on the shores of the Atlantic, where the sun rises on America, or on the Pacific where it sets. It is safe to say that in a month, those Northern Californians victimized by the earthquake will likely be where Carolinans are now. Still caught somewhere between hope and despair, determined nonetheless to go on. Miles Saunders, Channel 3 reports, Sullivan's Island, South Carolina. When we continue tonight, some final thoughts about the 89 quake, some positive things that may have come out of it, and some images we will always remember. 
Our 11 o'clock news is coming up in just a moment, and we'll have more earthquake coverage, including a report on what tonight's aftershock did to the remains of the Nimitz Freeway. We'll also show you what some San Franciscans did at 5.04 tonight, exactly one week after the big quake. And we'll have the story of one quake survivor, a woman who made it out of the rubble of the Nimitz. Throughout our program tonight, we've given you the address of the American Red Cross so that you could send in an earthquake donation. We urge you to do so. Right now, we'd like to give you that address one more time. You can send your contribution to the Northern California Earthquake Relief Fund, Post Office Box 160167, Sacramento, California. The zip code is 95816. And be sure to specify that your donation is to be used to help the victims of last Tuesday's earthquake in Northern California. We turn back once again tonight to Stan Atkinson, who's standing by in San Francisco. And Stan, one of the things that's so terrific about the place where you're standing right now is that it is not part of the destruction, that we're seeing the city that we love, and we're seeing the place as we want to see it in the future, as we want to build toward. What is the spirit there tonight? It feels like the same old San Francisco, but in many ways that is misleading. Because if you drive about two miles that way over Russian Hill, and you go down the other side of it, you see an area that is darkened in the aftermath of what has happened. An aftermath that is going to plague the people of the marina for the next 18 weeks is the estimation. A 50 square, 57 square block area. Eight of it, eight square blocks, totally cordoned off and shut down. But 57 square blocks are affected by gas leaks. And so they're going to have to dig up all the streets in the marina. They're going to have to replace no less than 10 miles of gas lines more than four months before that's all going to take place in a huge, vital part of residential San Francisco. Wonderful thing, even though we're considering all of this damage and all of the effort that's going to have to go into rebuilding and the cost, to look at least at the dignity and the humanity and the heroism of San Francisco as it, and Oakland, of course, and all of Northern California as the Bay Area pulls itself forward. Maybe you could comment on that as well. There's a great sense of resilience here, as I said earlier. It's something that this city has been known for. It rebuilt itself like the phoenix out of the ashes in 1906 and became one of the most glorious cities on this earth. It is still one of the most glorious cities, and its people and its character never lost a beat even at 5.04 on Tuesday. I sure wish they'd turn the lights back on on the Bay Bridge. Herb Kane, are you listening? Tell them to turn the lights back on on the Bay Bridge and give us something to feel some hope for the future for. It's too dark, it's too depressing to fly into San Francisco and see that. There are four million people who live between Santa Cruz and Watsonville in the south and the Golden Gate in the north, that area that was most profoundly affected by the quake. Uh, that's about, uh, well, four million out of California's 28 and a half million. That's a fair chunk of people. And think of it, all of those men and those women and those children experienced in this past week the most terrifying and most destructive experiences, perhaps for many of them, of their whole lives. For all of them, whether they lost family or friends, or they lost possessions, or they lost property, at 5.04 on Tuesday, their lives changed. Now they need our help and they need our support. It is the very least we can do. For months and maybe for years to come, wherever they live or they travel or they work or they play, in this part of Northern California, there will be constant reminders, visible reminders of the calamity that has taken place. And long after that physical damage is repaired, for many, there will be emotional scars, and there will be memories, and there will be those lingering fears. There will, however, be other things to come out of this disaster, things far more positive and perhaps far more enduring. There will always be a bond between those who endured the quake, who coped with its effects, and who are now trying to rebuild their communities. For one brief moment, those millions of people, from the migrant workers of Watsonville to the business and professional people of the Marina District, they all shared the same experience and felt the same fear. Collectively, they are now trying to overcome the same tragedy. 
Now, wherever they go in this world, whatever they become in the years ahead, all of them will share and remember that moment, that evening in October, when the ground began to shake. And for those of us who also felt the shake, but who escaped the full fury of the quake, there will forever be images of those ordinary people who became heroes in a moment of crisis. Men and women who put aside their own fears, their own concerns, and their own safety to help others in need. In so many cases, others they had never known before and may never see again. Those heroic images and that bond among survivors are as much a part of what happened last Tuesday as anything else. And perhaps, given time, they will be what we remember the most. They will be the legacy of this tragedy.